The scripture for today's sermon is in Luke 1, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 25. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all these things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at this birth, for he will be a great for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be fulfilled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord of their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the, to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. This is the word of the Lord. All right, good morning. We are starting uh, Advent this morning, and so uh, that is always an exciting uh, season of the year, one of my favorite uh, times of uh, the year. And uh, so um, we are glad you're here, excited that you're here to come and worship Jesus, uh, set our hearts, prepare our hearts uh, for him. The word Advent, interestingly, comes from the Latin word Adventus, which means coming or visit. Advent is a season when we're looking forward to, obviously, the coming of Christ, um, both in the gospel accounts, we see it in his first coming, and also as Christians today, Advent is a season where we can reflect and we can long for his second coming that's ultimately uh, to come. And so Advent is a season of anticipation, right? For those in the first century, they were longing for the Messiah to come and finally set them free. And for those of us here in the 21st century, right, in the midst of our challenges and difficulties and opportunities in our lives, right, we're longing for Jesus to return and make all things new. And, and so Advent is really a beautiful season where we set our hearts on Christ and his kingdom, um, the kingdom that he's come to establish in his birth and the kingdom that is ultimately um, coming when he creates a new uh, heavens and new earth. And so Advent really helps orient us on the bigger story of the Bible, right? What God is doing in the world, what God came to do that very first Christmas, and what God is coming again to do to establish a new heavens and new earth. But Advent also reminds us that we are part of what God is doing here and now, spreading the good news of the gospel uh, to people around us. It's good news of great joy. And so in Luke's um, beautiful uh, account, uh, we read in Luke 2, 10 through 11, the angel said, fear not, for behold, I bring to you 
good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And so uh, Advent here and now um, is not simply about looking back to Christ's first coming and looking forward to his second coming, uh, but it's all about celebrating this good news of great joy that we have in Christ right here and now and spreading that good news of great joy to the world we live in. What God is doing in the world right now is spreading that good news of what Jesus has done um, so that we can celebrate it, so we can enjoy it together, and then also so we can share it with uh, a world desperately in need of it. And so um, hopefully this will be a wonderful opportunity, this Advent series, to celebrate the good news of great joy that we all share because of what Jesus Um, has done. And this morning to set up our series, I want to start by looking at how John prepares the way for Jesus. In Luke's gospel, John doesn't start directly with Jesus and his birth and what he's doing, but he sets things up with who John is and what he's doing. And so I want to start um, in Luke chapter 1, those first 25 verses that we read, how John prepares the way for Jesus. And to do that, I want to look here at three things out of uh, Luke's account that I want you to notice this morning. I want you to see the angel's declaration I want you to see Zechariah's doubt and God's dependability. So the angel's declaration, Zechariah's doubt, God's dependability. And my aim for this morning's message is that we would walk away with an even greater confidence in God's absolute dependability to deliver joy this holiday season. So, so before we jump right in, we need to do a little bit of context here. And so if you're flipping over there to Luke's Gospel, uh, chapter 1, you'll notice that there is an introduction here um, by Luke as he opens this Gospel um, in verses 1 through 4. Um, in so much as that many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who were from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me Also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. And so Luke is writing his gospel to explain the incredible growth of this church, of this Jesus movement as it's spreading all over the Greco-Roman world. People want to know what on earth explains this incredible movement that is afoot, that is absolutely changing the very fabric of that world and that culture. And so uh, Luke writes this to Theophilus. He wants to write him in very educated, uh, ornate introduction here. This would have been fairly uh, standard fare for well-educated Greco-Roman letter writing at the time, this kind of formal introduction explaining his goals, his objectives, his ideas, the work that he had put into this letter. Luke claims to have interviewed eyewitnesses, spoken with the apostles and other leaders of this new movement, and thoroughly researched the events surrounding Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And he's putting together all of this into an orderly account that his contemporaries could confirm and corroborate what's happening here. So Luke is functioning as a historian, right? He's saying, I've, I've compiled an ordin- a very orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so you can confirm the things you, you have heard and so that you can have certainty in the faith that you've been established in. And not only is Luke attentive to the historical details, he's also a master storyteller. He opens his narrative not by taking us directly to Jesus' birth, but to a faithful old couple living in Judea who have not been able to have children. And so the story starts here, right, with just an ordinary couple going about their ordinary lives when God breaks in in an extraordinary way. And so verses 5 through 7 we read in the days of Herod, King of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. And so uh, Luke is starting here with this very ordinary old couple, faithful couple that loves Jesus. We learn that he's a priest, um, that he's been serving God faithfully his entire life, um, and yet they don't have a child, which in that culture would have been absolutely heartbreaking. Um, Not only is it this struggle with infertility and uh, just all the heartbreak and sadness that that brings into someone's life, uh, but even deeper here in that culture, there's an incredible stigma against people that were not able to have children, and so in that culture, children were seen as a blessing from the Lord. So for this old faithful couple who have served the Lord faithfully all those years to not have children uh, would have been a great reproach in that 
uh, culture, and it would have been a tragic situation in which they find themselves. But if you're familiar, of course, with the biblical narrative, we know that God has a way of doing some pretty extraordinary things with infertile couples. And so if you look back in the Old Testament at Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Rachel, Elkanah and Hannah, their story after story of God doing the remarkable with couples uh, like this. And so after 400 years of silence, God is about to do something spectacular uh, once again in the history of his people. And everything changes really for Zechariah and his wife um, on this ordinary day, this ordinary life they're living when Zechariah is chosen by lot to enter the temple to burn incense. And so in verse eight through nine, we read, now while he was serving as a priest before the God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And so this would have been a life, once in a lifetime opportunity. It's estimated uh, that there were roughly 18,000 priests on duty, right, at Zechariah's time, not at one time, but 8,000 priests scattered all the way throughout Israel at that time. And so to be chosen out of one of those 18,000 priests, you know, for this daily burning of incense, which would have happened, you know, in the morning and in the evening every day. I mean, if you do the math on that, 18,000 priests, you know, twice a day, 365 days a year, um, the odds are not great for that to happen. And the, and the kicker is you can only do this one time in your life. This was a privilege as a priest that would have been like the climax of Zechariah's career. And so he is now well advanced in year. He's old. He's never in the course of his entire life been able to go into the holy place in the temple and light the incense before the Lord, go into God's presence itself. And yet this day, this special day, he has been chosen by lot and he is going to go in and light uh, the incense there in the sanctuary. And this would be uh, no ordinary opportunity to offer incense as we're going to see here in verses 10 through 17, uh, which I'm going to read for you now. And, well, and the whole multitude of people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And so with this multitude of people gathered outside of the temple for prayers, probably the evening prayers, which would have been when you had very large crowds gathered, Zechariah goes into the temple to offer incense. And I got a cool little picture here, uh, which you guys can place up on there, which maybe would help place this a little bit more of what it would have looked like to walk into Herod's um, incredible temple there, um, looking at the altar of incense is right kind of in front of you. The Holy of Holies is separated there by a curtain. You have all of the, the lamp and all of the other, all the candlesticks, all of the other um, accompaniments of worship there. And so this is Zechariah's big moment, right? He's about to walk into the temple for the first time, into the actual holy place of the temple, first and only time in his entire life. Uh, everything is kind of culminating on this incredible moment. And then he's going to meet like an angel right in the middle of this once in a lifetime opportunity. And he is absolutely terrified. If you could just imagine the, the privilege, the anticipation, all of the nerves as he's finally walking into the temple for this once in a lifetime opportunity. And then to be met with an angel. I mean, he's just not expecting this at all, right? As most people in the Bible, when they encounter an angel, they're not like, oh, sweet, I just saw an angel. That's cool. I'm going to put that on my resume. No, people are like terrified. Like, Whoa. I just met with like an angel from God. And so you see Zechariah in verse 12, I mean, he is utterly um, terrified. He's distressed. Um, fear fell upon him at this moment. What is going to happen? But the angel tells him, of course, do not be afraid, as all the angels tell everybody when they meet them. When you meet an angel, shining warrior of light from God himself, you'd be terrified too. They say, do not be afraid. Good news. Your wife, Elizabeth, is going to bear a son, and you're going to call him John, even in your old age, you're going to be able to have a baby and he's going to bring you guys incredible 
joy. I love how Luke uh, just puts the emphasis on the joy that is, they're going to bring in verse 13. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. You shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice in his birth. Luke is like, how many words for joy can I pile up here to just try to describe how much joy is going to pour out of this child's birth as he prepares the way for uh, Jesus. It's, it's a lot of joy, right? Joy um, and gladness for Zechariah and Elizabeth, of course, on a very personal level, they have been infernal their entire lives, right? They have been longing for a child. And finally, God is going to answer uh, that prayer. But this joy is going to resonate much more deeply. It's going to have much further of an impact because we see here in verse 14, right? You will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at the birth. This birth is going to have a ripple effect of joy that's going to spread throughout the nation and ultimately spread to the uttermost ends of the earth. There's a lot of joy happening because of these um, tidings. And so um, as we consider that, right, Luke is going to continue to unpack what this joy means and what this joy um, looks like. And so in verse 15, it says, He will be great before the Lord. He will not drink wine or strong drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Even from his mother's womb, he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will go before them in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready to the Lord a people prepared. What Gabriel's announcement is doing is connecting um, God's promises in the book of Malachi um, to what God is doing today. It has been, um, if you know anything about biblical history, 400 silent years, right? Between the last prophet and his promises from God, the prophecies of God's movement happening, and then God answering those promises. So if you flip back to the very last page of the Old Testament, if you flip back to Malachi chapter 4, uh, you will see um, here in Malachi 4, 5, through six, um, the words of anticipation here, the words of prophecy that are coming, um, that the angel is saying, hey, the time has come, it's about to happen. That promise that God made all the way back in Malachi 4, it's finally gonna come to fulfillment. God is on the move once again, uh, and this is an opportunity for great joy. So in Malachi 4, starting in verse five, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction, right? God is not gonna strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Rather, he's gonna send a prophet along in the spirit and power of Elijah. He's gonna turn God's people back to him. He's gonna turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. There's gonna be reconciliation of the people with God. There's gonna be reconciliation at the family level. There's gonna be justice and peace that flow out of this new era of God's work in the lives of of their people. Luke is telling us that the promised Elijah is almost here. It's time. God is on the move again, and he is going to turn the hearts of the people back to him. In the rest of the New Testament, this language of turning um, takes on the meaning of right, people turning from darkness to light, turning to death to life, turning to God in conversion, experiencing new life in him. God is on the move. People are going to come back into a relationship with God and turning uh, to God is going to be for them the source of true joy. Uh, I love how C.S. Lewis said it classically, right? If we find in ourselves a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, we must be made for another world. This is the kind of joy here that John is going to bring to the people of Israel, a joy that can't be found anywhere else in any other pleasures, any of the other things that we try to look for it, try to experience it in, try to find it in. John is going to be the forerunner of a joy that we all need, an eternal joy, an everlasting joy, a joy we can't find here in this world. And, and I love what God is doing in this text. God is using this ordinary, faithful people in his story uh, of redemption. He wants to take this ordinary couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth, and sweep them up into this bigger story of what God is doing in the world, uh, bringing his joy to uh, the people of Israel and ultimately to all the nations of 
the world. God loves awakening ordinary faithful people to the joy that can only be found in Jesus. And that's the good news, right, that we celebrate this holiday season. God is on the move. God is working in the lives of very ordinary, faithful, available people who just want to experience and be a part of what God is doing in the world. God is still on the move, turning hearts back to him, restoring to us the joy of his salvation. And so we get to today, uh, not only Zechariah and Elizabeth, but we too are swept up into this story. We're a part of what God is doing in the world. God is just not simply turning the hearts of the people of Israel back to him as he will do through John the Baptist. God is turning people from every nation and tribe and language and people back to him through his word, through his spirit, as we get the opportunity to share the good news that only Jesus brings. So the angel Abel the angel Gabriel gives this remarkable declaration, right? You know, good news of great joy is coming through John, this child that's going to prepare the way for Jesus. How will Zechariah respond? Uh, Verse 18, and Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. Uh, One of the things I love about the Bible is that it doesn't airbrush over the characters in the story, removing all their flaws and all of their weaknesses, We already know that Zechariah and Elizabeth are a faithful and righteous couple. They love the Lord. They've served him faithfully. Zechariah is a priest. He's a man of God. But even for Zechariah, this is a stretch, right? So he reminds the angel that he's old, that his wife is advanced in years. So like biologically, this isn't happening. Um, Thank you for coming, angel of God, to tell me (laughs) these good tidings. But like this just doesn't happen. Like we have longed... We've waited too long for this baby. We've cried too many bitter tears for this thing to happen. It's too late. You know, thanks for that awesome, you know, message from God. But but I don't think this is going to happen. I'm not ready for that. Or or maybe at least could you give me a sign? You know, verse 18, he's like, how shall I know this? Uh, Because this is kind of not really going to happen. With something this personal, with something this painful, uh, Zechariah is looking for a sign. And, and I love that the Bible doesn't present us with naive, like fake, plastic characters who immediately receive the news of the miraculous without beating an eyebrow. Like, yeah, cool, sweet. It's an angel. I'm going to have a baby. Awesome. Life is great. Isn't it so good to follow Jesus? Like, that's not the kind of tone you see in the Bible, right? It's a much more realistic sense of, like, this is uh, a little bit hard to take in at the moment. And I, and I love this. The Bible's so clear that even the most godly, the most mature people sometimes struggle with doubt. They wrestle with doubt in very difficult ways. And of course, this is why the angel rebukes him in verses 19 through 20. He's like, you should know better. You're a man of God. You're a priest. Uh, You should be trusting what God is doing. I love verses 19 through 20. And the angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I was sent to speak with you and bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you do not believe the words which will be fulfilled in their time. I mean, you can almost feel like the exasperation in his voice. Like, are you kidding me? I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. Like, if I say this is going to happen, this is going to happen. And you have the nerve to like say, what? This is not going to happen. Um, if God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And, uh, and I love that. But I, but I love the honesty in the Bible, right, about the flaws of some of the leading figures in the text, right? This honesty gives us space to deal with our own doubts, right? If Zechariah can struggle with the miraculous, um, so can we, right? If God is patient with Zechariah in the midst of his struggles and his doubts and his questions, right, he's going to be patient with us Um, today. And I think it's easier probably than ever to doubt because we live in a very skeptical age, right? Everybody today is kind of like, yeah, you can't trust anybody in power. You can't trust the story. You can't even trust the news anymore, right? It's all fake news. I mean, everything's got to spin. You know, we're very cynical, very jaded. And and so these truth claims of the Bible come at us in a very like, we kind of look at them a little cynically, a little skeptically, and it's easy for us Uh, to doubt what God is doing in the world. We look at the church and we go, man, the church is so much in need of renewal and revival and and we struggle so much in our lives. Like how can we believe that God is really on the move, really bringing this kind of joy um, to the people? And we can say, hey, we're so far removed from those events, right? It's been 2,000 plus years since Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Um, 
we're kind of a little bit distant from what God was doing in those incredible moments. But you gotta remember, Zechariah was in the same situation, right? He had been waiting along with the rest of God's people 400 years for God to finally fulfill those promises in the end of Malachi there, to finally renew his work through this Elijah-like figure that was gonna come and bring God's hope and promises to the people of Israel and, and that joy to the nations. He was waiting 400 years and so it's not surprising that at that time it's like, yeah, a little skeptical, a little, because I don't really know what you're doing, God, in this whole situation and yet God is incredibly patient. God is incredibly kind to Zechariah. It's not like, Zechariah, all right, you didn't believe me. I'm gonna zap you from, you know, from my uh, place in the temple there. No, he's so patient, so kind. Uh, Zechariah does get himself a rebuke and uh, for it, uh, but God is gonna work in incredible, remarkable ways in his life. Uh, but it's important, I think, for us to recognize, right, we're not alone in our doubts. We're not alone in our struggles, right? The leading characters throughout the narrative of the scripture are constantly struggling to grapple with, God, what are you doing in the world right now? What's going on in this situation and season in our life? Uh, what are you doing in Grand Rapids right now? And uh, what are you doing around the world? Right? We struggle to get our minds around that sometimes. And, and that's, that's true for all the major characters of the Bible. But that doesn't mean God has changed. That, God, that does not mean God is less uh, dependable. In fact, uh, we've looked at Angel's declaration, declaration, we've looked at Zechariah's doubt, and I want to finish with God's absolute dependability. As we look at this story, right, we see that Zechariah may be plagued by doubt. He's wondering, God, are you really going to do this? Right? The angel Gabriel reminds him of God's absolute dependability. And so when you read verses 19 through 20 from that perspective, um, you get a sense of, yeah, we struggle with that. We wonder what is God doing in the world, in this season of our lives, in the situation, and, you know, What's going on, God, with cancer or, or with his job or with my relationships or with my kids or like, what are you doing? And yet we read in verse 19, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I was sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you do not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, right? God's promises are always fulfilled in their time. We don't like that little <laughs> like that little clause, in their time, do we? We want it to be done in our time, right? When we want things to happen, right? According to our agenda, according to our schedule. And yet, this promise is God will be faithful. God will fulfill his promises in his good time. And Gabriel's rebuke is also accompanied, I love this, by a rather ironic sign that these things will happen. Zechariah asks for a sign. It's like, how will I know? And God gives him one. He strikes him mute. So we will now have nine months to kind of meditate on God's faithfulness and God's goodness and God's kindness. He's like, yeah, you're going to get a sign, all right, but it's going to not be maybe a sign that you like. You're, gonna, you're not even going to be able to talk and even tell people what this is because you didn't believe it. But I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to fulfill my promise. And after those nine months are up, I'll give you an opportunity to declare that for um, yourself. Um, and I just imagine this being a really humorous moment. Um, I think God has a great sense of humor and I think we should as well. But I mean, if you could just imagine like after the immediate awkwardness of the situation, like he's in the temple for an extended period of time, the people wonder like what happened to him? You know, when he walks out there at the end, the priest would then give a benediction, the ironic benediction. And he's like, just kind of lip dubbing the like <laughs> ironic benediction. He's unable to actually like say anything. Everyone's like, what happened to this guy? Can you just imagine how humorous it would be to try and like through sign language, like tell people, yeah, I just met an angel. I'm gonna have a baby. Like, I mean, how do you do that? It's like the ultimate charades challenge here. Like, I mean, I mean, this is a really humorous moment. I mean, if you think about this, like this guy is out, this old guy is out there, cannot even speak, cannot even talk. And I mean, I love it. It's in verse 20. And he came out, he was unable to speak and they realized that he'd seen a vision and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. <laughs> so it's like, hey guys, baby, I don't know. I don't know what he did, but like, you know, what was happening? But I mean, you just got to imagine, God's got a sense of humor in this and a sense of poetic justice. Yeah, you're going to get a sign, but it's going to be a sign that's not going to allow you to ruin this wonderful secret that I am about to fulfill. You're not going to be able to tell anybody but the most incredible news you've ever gotten in your entire life. It's the ultimate poetic justice. And finally, God's absolute dependability is confirmed by 
Elizabeth's conception, verses 23 through 24. So when his time of service was ended, he went home. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in my days what he, when he looked on me to take away my reproach from among the people. So miraculously, right, in their old age, like Abraham and Sarah in the Old Testament, they're able to have a child. Um, and we aren't quite sure why Elizabeth kept herself hidden for five months. Um, was she worried about the pregnancy in her old age? Was she um, wanting to keep this a secret, like Zechariah, who was kind of forced to kind of keep this under wraps by not being able to talk? Was she just kind of marveling at the wonder and just worshiping Jesus during this season uh, of life? Was she trying to avoid the publicity that such a birth would bring? Uh, we're not sure, but we do know from her response that she sees this child as God's faithfulness to her in removing her pro- reproach from among the people and delivering joy very deeply into her life. Right? God has been dependable in delivering joy in her life, and God has been dependable in delivering joy to the people of Israel, as we're going to see in the next couple of weeks of this Advent series. So if God is absolutely dependable in delivering joy, how can we use this opportunity to deal with our doubts and prepare our hearts this season to receive his joy? Or another way to say it is, how do we present ourselves from being swept up in the Christmas craziness and arriving frazzled and exhausted for Christmas, right? We, we want to prepare our hearts this year, right, as we step into this Advent season to just step into the wonder and the beauty of this wonderful holiday, to just bask in all the joy that is ours um, in Christ. And so how do we do that? Um, John Piper has some great wisdom in his Advent devotional, Good News of Great Joy, which I highly recommend. You can uh, find it on our Facebook page and follow along with it this Advent season for free. Hopefully it gives you some wonderful wisdom here as a family to begin to think about this holiday season. But he offered really four suggestions for preparing your hearts to receive the joy that only Jesus can bring. And I want to give them to you today with a few comments that I want to add to them and commend them to you. Go check out the uh, devotional be helpful. But he warns, don't let Christmas find you unprepared. I mean spiritually unprepared. Its joy and impact will be so much greater if you are ready. And so here I am standing up first weekend of Advent. Get prepared. If you want to maximize your joy this holiday season in Jesus, it's going to take some preparation. It's going to take some planning. It's going to take some I was going to say strategizing, but that's not even a word. It's going to take some thinking and strategy here. So Here's four suggestions from John Piper for doing that. First, meditate on the fact that we need a savior. Christmas is an indictment before it becomes a delight. It will not have its intended effect until we feel deliberately the need for a savior. And so um, Christmas is most of all, as we know, about the birth of a savior. And until we see our need of saving and the salvation Jesus offers, we're going to miss out on the deepest joys of the season. Until we see our deepest need needs met by Christ, we're not going to experience the deepest joys that he offers. So, so take this season to meditate on our need for a Savior, on the areas in your heart, in your life, the weaknesses, the struggles, the flaws, maybe that no one else sees, but you know in your own heart of hearts, right? Jesus has got to provide healing, redemption to uh, take this season to focus on our Savior. Second, engage in sober self-examination. Advent, this is Piper again, by the way. (laughs) Second, engage in sober self-examination. Advent is to Christmas what Lent is to Easter. Search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's Psalm 139, 23 through 24. Let every heart prepare him room by cleaning house. End quote here. And so Piper's saying, look, this is a season to take stock of your life. What is cluttering your life right now? What noise is going on in your life that's just all negativity, that's all uh, meaningless, just nonsense from the season, that's stressing you out, that's just uh, causing anxiety in your life right now, um, that is drawing hearts away from Jesus? What are some of maybe the counterfeit joys that you are settling for rather than the deeper, truer joys that Jesus offers It's a great opportunity here in this season to be cleaning house, be thinking about what God is doing and so that we can celebrate the deeper, truer joys we have in Jesus. Third, and this is great (coughs) for you parents, 
Uh, build God-centered anticipation and expectancy. This is Piper again, by the way. Third, build God-centered anticipation and expectancy and excitement into your home, especially for the children. If you are excited about Christmas, they will be too. If you can only make Christmas exciting with material things, how will the children get a thirst for God? Uh, bend the efforts of your imagination to make the wonder of the king's arrival visible for children. I love that. Isn't that beautiful? Parents, Bend all of the efforts of your imagination to make Christmas memorable to children. And not just the cookies and the, ca- and the presents and, and, you know, trimming the tree, but the deeper, more profound spiritual realities around this holiday. Uh, create some great fi- Christmas family traditions. Do it with some other folks in our church. I love hearing about different couples that are going out, you know, going out, picking their tree together, kind of making a day of it, making an event of it. That's wonderful. Um, Get a great Advent devotional. I've just recommended one. There are many, many more. I was just talking to Josh today. He picked up a new one by Sinclair Ferguson. That was a fantastic devotional to be reading and think about. Don't remember the name of it, but you can always talk to Josh. Get an Advent calendar. Kids love Advent calendars, right? They pop open each of those little things. They're reading a verse. They're getting a candy. Like, make it memorable uh, for them. Enjoy the rich wealth of Advent music and hymns. There's such rich, beautiful music around this time of the year and so many Wonderful resources to make this season meaningful. And fourth, then, and finally, Piper says, be much in the scriptures and memorize the great passages. Is not my word like fire, says the Lord. Jeremiah 23, 29. Gather around the fire this Advent season. It is warm. It is sparkling with colors of grace. It is healing for a thousand hertz. It is light for dark nights. Love that quote, right? Get in. Get into those big promises of God in the scriptures. Celebrate them. Memorize them. Meditate on them together. Put them up around your house. Write them on your whiteboard or your chalkboard or wherever you write notes up to yourself. Remember the great promises of God. Uh, there is healing for a thousand hearts. It is light for dark nights. Get those promises of God into your hearts, into your life, into the daily rhythms of your advent routine. Imagine what would happen this holiday season if we started with a conviction of God's absolute dependability in delivering joy and planned our holidays to maximize our joy in Christ. What a great prospect. What a wonderful opportunity to think about this year. And that's my challenge to you, my dare to you, dare you to maximize your joy in Christ this holiday season. Prepare your hearts. Prepare room for him. That may mean doing a little house cleaning, getting rid of some of the clutter to make some more room in your heart and your life and your family for Jesus this holiday season. So let me pray that that might happen. Even this morning as a church and as we collaborate on this together in community, share ways we're doing this, share the ways God is moving in our lives, that there would be great joy in Jesus spilling out of this. So Father, thank you for um, your absolute reliability, your absolute dependability, Uh, There might have been 400 years of silence um, for God's people, but you respond, God, in remarkable, powerful ways in our text today. And we see that you're on the move. You're still on the move today, right here in Grand Rapids, right here in our lives. Would you help us to make room in our lives for the joy that only Jesus brings? Would you come by the power of your spirit, God, and just give us a deep love for our Savior, a deep sense of what he's done in our lives. Help us to really build into our lives new rhythms and practices and habits that will remind us more and more of him. Would you maximize our joy in Jesus through your spirit? We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.